All right. We're live, I think. Um, okay. We are going to talk about Sir Gawain and the Green Knight today. Um, I wanted to pull up some uh, photos, which reminds me what we're going to do. We'll show you what it looked like. What would this be? This would be in here. Is it bad in my head? I was picturing like the Belgian giant. Uh, yeah, that's bad. Gawain and the Green Goblin. I'd watch that. <laughs> Emma, do you mind closing that door so that we don't block out our ear? Hey. Hey. Oh my gosh, there's a student. There's a student back there the whole time. What room number is this? Two something. Ten. Watch you and see. We have crossed over into Middle English poetry. We were doing Old English last time, um, then they had that war. And the Normans, the French, won that war at the Battle of Hastings in October of 1066. Uh, and the result is a Frenchified English language, one that is a little bit closer uh, to the language we know and love. Of course, you are reading in a, a modern English translation. Um, yeah, yes, you were. Uh, whereas I've got the real thing right here, not to brag or anything. Um, okay, uh, let's start with uh, the poetics. What kind of poetics did you notice? Like, what kind of poetry features? What's that? Alliteration is the big one, okay? So again, we don't have end rhyme, unless we do. Uh, and it's alliterative. This is, we're, this is a period called the alliterative revival in Middle English. So it's like hundreds of years old and it's already, they're already having a revival, which strikes me as funny. There's already a revival in English poetry, they're looking backward at Old English, which was always um, alliterative. And these Middle English types are copying that. By the way, we're, we're about in the 1380s now, uh, which is sort of this golden decade, 1380s plus or minus, a golden decade for English poetry. Uh, you have Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which I love. You've got Chaucer, you've got Piers Plowman. Okay. Uh, Piers Plowman is a um, super long poem that tells uh, the story of the main character named Will, uh, and he 
meets this guy named Pierce Plowman, and he goes on a pilgrimage uh, to learn about the world. And uh, his main goal is to learn um, how to be the best person. He doesn't want to be a good person. He doesn't want to be a better person. He wants to be the best kind of person. This is, is a repeated theme uh, in there. So, um, uh, again, uh, in Pierce Plowman, you get the alliterative revival. Uh, you get it. There's another poem that's um, that I really love called um, the alliterative Mort, the alliterative, alliterative Mort d'Arthur. Uh, <clears throat> Mort d'Arthur is just French for the death of King Arthur. Um, and the alliterative version is my favorite version, as opposed to the version by Mallory, which we'll take a look at in the coming weeks. Okay, so um, this poem is alliterative. They want to. They're aware of and they're copying uh, the poetry of the old times before those darned um, Normans came in and ruined everything 300 years prior. Okay. Um, what else? That's not the only thing going on here poetically. There is plenty of alliteration. What else do you see poetically? Call out anything formal. Yeah, Sarah. It's got the like 14 lines of like the big line and then like the five lines of the little small. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know what you would call that, but. I do. It's called the Bob and Wheel. And it, it, it appears almost nowhere else in uh, Middle English poetry. But, you know, if, if I was to ask you, say, on a test, I don't know. Um, what are the two central features, the two main features of poetic features of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, alliteration, and then secondly is the Bob and Wheel. So the Bob and Wheel, it's a little bit confusing. Just that short part is the Bob and Wheel. Okay, so the big long chunks, those are just, I don't know, big long chunks. And this little thing here that ends off, caps off the big long chunks. And the big long chunks are not normal. They're not always going to be 14 lines or whatever. They're just kind of like eh, ballpark that many lines. And then the bob and wheel are very formalized. They're very locked down. They're, they, they follow a strict pattern. Um, so, Those limiting ourselves to the, what's that? Those like five lines have a line scheme. Yes, so again, the, the five lines, that's what the bob and wheel is. And they do have a rhyme scheme. And what is it? A, B, A, B, A. Yes. Yeah. Fine. Great. Yes. Are you saying Bob and? Bob. Bob and? And okay. wheel. Bob. The Bob and wheel. <laughs> I don't know why that's confusing to you. Um, it's a Bob and wheel. It's a reference to um, like a spinning wheel for cloth and string or whatever, like whatever. Who's that troll with the spinning wheel? I don't know, Rumble 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 Rumble. Rumble. <laughs> think about Think about one of those. Uh, I don't, honestly, I don't understand what those are or how they work. But I know Bob and Wheel is a reference to that. Somebody thought like, oh, it's a little thing. It's got a little wheel and a big wheel. And we'll call it a Bob and a Wheel. That's, that is the origin of that name. Um, the spinning So the little dinky part uh, is the bottom, the longer part is the wheel, and it does have uh, a distinct rhyming pattern. It's A, B, A, B, A. Um, what else about the wheel? Yes? Oh, I was going to ask, oh, go ahead. you said the bottom wheel, is that like exclusive to Sir Gawain, or is that exclusive to like Middle English? You find it rarely in Middle English. And if you're going to take like a subject GRE and like name one Bob and Wheel poem, it's going to be Gawain. Okay. There are, off the top of my head, I can't name one, but I know that it does appear at least a couple more times, mm -hmm. very less famous, very less famously. So not the only time, but basically the only time that 99% of English students are going to see it ever. Um, yeah. Uh, it rhymes well. What else does it do? The bob and wheel? Formally? This is, oh no, you see it in, in this translation. I don't know, maybe this is a little bit of a trick question because you already said it. 
But it not only does it rhyme, it also does the alliteration thing, okay? And like if you look at the amount of syllables he's using, few, and the rhymes he has to do, and the alliteration he has to do, all in this little, you know, tight little package here, um, this is impossible. Like, try to do this. It's super hard. So, um, it's kind of a feat of, um, you know, poetic um, excellence uh, that he set before himself to do this. It's uh, with all the, all that's required of this little bobbin wheel. It's, it's a lot. Uh, and he does it, like, several times per chapter. Chapter, uh, book. Uh, sometimes they're called, let's see, this one they're called, let me get this right. In the original, the chapters are referred to as, drum roll. Here. No. Is it just fit? No. Well, f sometimes it's feet. And, okay, in the original, it just has, literally, it's just Roman numerals. But you do sometimes see feet. The Latin there is passus, which is the Latin for foot. Um, and I know for sure in um, uh, Piers Plowman, uh, you get you don't get chapters, you get feet. Foot one, foot two, foot three. Okay. Uh, but it's in four parts. This uh, this poem is in four parts anyway. All right, so uh, that does it for the form of it. Four parts, uh, bob and wheel, separated by longer sections that are um, just alliterative. And the alliterative pattern is not nearly as formal in Middle English as it was in Old English. We saw where it was like one, two, space, one, right, um, for the alliteration. Here it's very much, he's just kind of grabbing and getting what he can. And yeah, there's alliteration, but it's not as formally locked down as it was in Old English, so um, it's different. The, um, the end rhyme thing is very much a continental practice, and by continental I mean specifically, I'm talking about Italian and French, okay? By 1380, the Italians, the French are already kicking off the Renaissance in their respective cultures. And the Renaissance, uh, this is something I'd like you to deposit in your brain. The Renaissance in Europe, uh, you know, it's literally, the word there is rebirth, nascent, N-A-S-C-E-N-T, like a nascent technology, say, as one that's being born. Okay, the root word is nativity, or is the same as nativity? Um, birth. Uh, a rebirth is what the Renaissance is. And it's the rebirth of what? Greek. Greek. The Greek language. Yeah? Greek language. Um, this whole time, from the fall of the Roman Empire until the Renaissance, Latin never really went away. Okay? Latin never really died because the monks would use it. It was the, um, if you're an intelligent person, this is how you spoke to each other, even if, no one actually spoke it outside of like um, churches or books. It is how um, uh, monks, like the, the educated people, would communicate to each other with Latin every time. Okay, so Latin was definitely still being used, if not spoken by the people. Latin evolved into Italian, um, well, old Italian. Latin evolved into old French. Um, and even the written stuff, as it was in the medieval period, um, saw some, I want to say degradation, but kind of degradation. Okay, so like the niceties, the finer points of Latin in the classical age were kind of being eroded over time, um, simplified over time, uh, because no one was using it naturally anymore, and they were just writing, and so they got some stuff wrong, and the, the language changed. Um, why was I going into all this? So Latin was around and it was still very influential among the learned. The choice to write this in, in English was um, um, bold, a bold choice. Why do I say that? Because this was specifically not the language you were supposed to do intelligent stuff with. Okay? Latin is the language for smart people with good educations. Okay? And I'm, I mean monks. I mean, government workers, uh, the elite. 
uh, that's Latin. So the common people, those are the ones who are still speaking English at this time. And so it's very much like this is meant to be sort of folksy in that way. Okay, it's meant to be uh, a pull from the old English. And yet, even still, whoever wrote this, we have no idea who wrote this. They didn't sign the manuscript. Whoever wrote this is also aware of and to an extent participating in the continental tradition of end rhyme. End rhyme. That's a very Italian, it's a very French thing to do. Because it's very, very, it's, it's much easier to rhyme in Italian than it is to rhyme in English. And so, but the, this guy wants to do it all. Okay? So again, what do we see? We see he's pulling from two, two traditions, poetically. He's pulling from the Old English tradition on the one hand, and the continental tradition, the European tradition on the other, slapping them together and making it work in his own language, not Latin. So um, he's, what he is attempting to do here is really pretty impressive. Once you put all, like once you see the context uh, that he's in, what he's trying to do, people aren't doing this yet. But in the 1380s, we get this explosion of English, okay? And again, uh, the, on the continent, they're studying Greek, they're remembering who Socrates is, they're remembering all these Greek translations of things. They're doing their art with better perspective. A rebirth, a flourishing of culture. We established how um, after the fall of the empire, the Roman Empire, literacy went way down. Okay, well now it's like, now people are reading again. Oh my gosh, and they're reading Greek. Wow, neat. Okay. But not quite yet on the little British island. They're kind of lagging. Uh, more on that as we go. Okay, that's the context. Uh, one last thing for context before we jump into the substance. Um, we have this uh, sometime in the 1800s. I don't have the date in my head, but some. <laughs> Jeez. At some point in the 1800s, <laughs> um, someone uh, was looking through their attic and found this old book, and stuffed within the binding of a book was this manuscript uh, that contained um, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, uh, a poem called Pearl, which is a really beautiful and sad poem. Uh, patience and cleanness. Cleanness sometimes translated as purity. Okay, so there's four poems. We assume they're all four written by the same guy. They're, they're in the same dialect. It makes it would make plenty of sense if they were written by the same guy. Um, and that's the only manuscript we have. So this poem was lost for centuries until it was rediscovered just like literally in an attic in the 1800s. So we are one weird accident of fate from not away from not having you know one of the major poets of the middle english period um pretty wild okay so so much for context um let's look at so these um this looks like it was drawn by somebody with their left hand and a crayon this is the actual um uh illustration of that one manuscript that we have. This appears in the original, and it looks like that for some reason. Um, and it's wrong. <laughs> What's wrong with this picture based on the story that you read? He's not really green. He's not totally green. His horse is green. His clothes are green. His but hair is blonde, and his face is, yeah, just white person face. <laughs> like, it's, he's completely green. His skin is green. His clothes are green. Everything about him is green. Um, We'll come back to that, but yeah, mistakes. Oh. Um, late 1300s, West Midland, England. Yeah, so again, <laughs> Renaissance, not Renaissance. Renaissance, not Renaissance. Um, uh, to be fair, there was uh, better art in another place in, uh, in England. This is the um, Wilton diptych. A diptych is two images, a triptych is three images, uh, but this is a Wilton Dittick. Um To be fair though, this was, uh, this is English art technically, but it was commissioned by a, uh, from a Dutch guy, I believe, so <laughs> the guy who actually painted was not English. Um, so, you know, you can, I mean, you know, I don't think I have to explain to you like how much better this looks than that. Um, but when you think about the Renaissance, you think about perspective, you think about um, 
people are the right size now. Ironically, if you look at, um, you know, David, like the, the sculpture David, ironically, his hands and feet are inhumanly big, if you really do the math on him. Uh, but he looks, <laughs> he looks great. He looks like a uh, real person uh, stature. But if you really get into the weeds, um, Da Vinci, or Michelangelo rather, was taking some liberties. Anyway. Okay, talk about that. Talk about that. Okay. And here, and you can see this today. If you go to London, if you go to the British Library in London, and you say, I'm an English student, well, show me this thing. They can dig it out for you. They have it, they kept it. Um, uh, and. This is really what I wanted to show you. This, yeah, those are words in English. Um, it's almost, you know, if you're, if this is the first time you're looking at it, this looks like, you know, some crazy moon language. But that's English. Um, their script was very different. Um, and it's hard even for people who have studied this stuff to make it out. Like, it's, it, this is a whole, like, typography is a whole field into itself. Um, but that is it. Any words that you would, okay. Can you kind of make this one out, this last word right here? Troy. Troy, yeah. Troy. all right. Troy. A reference to? Troy. Yes, that Troy. Um, but then a lot of this stuff, like, where's a, where's a good one that's impossible? And then what is this? <laughs> this stuff is just, every letter looks kind of the same -ish. Like an M, an M and N, like if you have the word in, I and an N, it will look almost indistinguishable from the letter M just because of the way they do up and down um, markings. So it's, it's tough. Um, there you go. Okay, enough of that. Did we leave any time to talk about the story? We did, we have plenty of time. Um, the story. Well, let's start with... Troy, let me throw this one out to you guys. Um, of all the things he could have started with, he starts with Troy. Uh, what's that about? Like, what can you tell me about the very beginning of the <laughs> poem? And, well, yeah, like, very open-ended question. Tell me about the beginning of the poem. What's going on? Well, it's the, the poem starts with, like, like the narrator, right? Yep. It's kind of giving us like some insight into it. And I think when he links it with Troy, it goes back to like so like a little bit of the Renaissance idea of like rediscovering like the, these Greek ideals. So he's, he's kind of like trying to put like the Arthurian canon, like linking it with like the Greek canon. Yep. Idea. Well, yeah. So this is, uh, I do want to t t uh, tweak one thing there, which is this is Latin still. This is Latin very much. Um, it's a reference to the Aeneid. Ta da! Yay! Right there. It's a reference to the Aeneid, which is the story of Aeneas, who gets named. He gets, the spelling is weird. Um, is the spelling in your translation weird? Aeneas. No, that's, uh, that's the regular English spelling there on line five. So he's, he's going all the way back. The poet is going all the way back to Troy, okay, which is the Aeneid. If you took world life with me, you will know that the Aeneid is um, kind of the third in a trilogy, okay? Homer does the Iliad, which is, Ilium is another name for Troy, so it could be called the Troyad, but it's called the Iliad. Um, and then there's the Odyssey, so it's the War of Troy, uh, the Trojan War, and then the uh, travails of Odysseus after the Trojan War, with me so far. And, um, <clears throat> That's Homer, and then 700 years later, Virgil said, yeah, but what happens to the Trojans after the Trojan War? And most of them died, except for Aeneas and his crew. And so this is his story, okay? So this, what the um, uh, Gawain poet is doing, and we don't know his name, so we call him Gawain poet, we call him Pearl poet. Back, you know, we're just doing our best. What the Gawain poet is doing is reaching back, not just to Virgil and like Latin and Rome, but all the way back, yes, to the Greeks, because, you know, if you're, if you're talking about Virgil, you're talking about Homer, okay? Because Homer, Virgil is like, ooh, I'm going to be the Latin version of that Greek guy, okay? 
So uh, he wants to emphasize, uh, I want to emphasize to you just how important Homer and Virgil were to Western literature as a whole. Everybody's trying to, everybody is riffing on these guys for over, like for thousands, literally thousands of years. Everybody is, has been riffing on these two, seen as the great, Homer and Virgil. Dante, uh, about this time, is um, a little bit before this poem is written. We get uh, the Inferno, okay, where Dante gives himself a guide. Dante writes himself into the Inferno. He's, it's a guided tour of hell. And who's his guide? It's, it's Virgil, okay, who is uh, an excellent pagan who doesn't believe, and so he is damned to hell. Um, but a cooler side of hell, not like the best part of hell, uh, is where Virgil is, and, and so he got it. Okay, so uh, the, um, the great works of the medieval period are always wanting to connect their, their cars to, you know, this train of great poetry. So, uh, yeah, even like for all this, for all the reaching back into Old English and trying to be traditionally English, he still makes this move of, oh, but I'm learned and continental as well, okay? So he's like, that's England for you. Is, is, it a, is it in Europe? Is it not, right? Like, they were in the EU for a while, now they're not in the EU. Like, that, the whole Brexit thing, you guys heard about that, right? Like, there was a huge, like, <laughs> like people got divorces over Brexit. Um, such a huge deal, but like that basic, um, Ambivalence about are we our own island? Are we a part of Europe? It goes, you know, all the way back. Uh, it's right here. Um, I, like we're both, we're not, we're our own thing. Okay, so that is very, very British. All right. Um, and to cap this off, uh, th there's a guy um, in uh, a descendant of Aeneas called Brutus who mythically goes on uh, from Rome after Aeneas kind of sets up where Rome is going to be someday. He doesn't actually found Rome. That's for his, like, his great-grandsons to do. But after Aeneas sets up, you know, starts the uh, dominoes dropping that will end in Rome, uh, one of his guys, one of his descendants named Brutus, goes and sails and uh, founds England, basically. Okay, so from Troy to Rome to England, we are important and good like these guys were too, so pay attention to us because we're also important, says uh, the poet. So the idea is like very, very like, oh yeah, Jupiter, Juno. Yeah. How did, so did they just like ignore that part of that? And yep. they just, yep. yep. so Aeneas Basically. exists in like the author universe, yep. but he's Christian. Yep. Okay. And we're not gonna think about that? <laughs> um, Dante, if you think that's weird, uh, read uh, The Divine Comedy. Okay, and The Divine Comedy is in three parts. It's the Inferno, uh, uh, Purgatorio, and Paradiso. Okay, and it's like in hell you find not just Virgil, but Aeneas is right there next to him. And it's like one of these guys invented the other one. <laughs> like um, there is a scene where you have like, again, Christian hell. So, I mean, ostensibly, with centaurs shooting bows and arrows. It's like, uh, and Dante was like, eh, whatever. Like, <laughs> they Christ washed them. What's that? They Christ washed them. Christ, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, um, like, C.S. Lewis does this. Uh, if you read Chronicles of Narnia, he's going to throw in fairies who are a northern fantasy thing. Like, by northern, I mean British and, and Viking, like, and, and Celtic, okay, fairies. Uh, next to, say, um, you know, cent again, centaurs and, and all these Greek monsters. And one time, uh, Tolkien called him out for this. Like, you can't just mash all this stuff together. And, uh, and C.S. Lewis says, well, you carry it around in the same bucket, don't you? Uh, and Tolkien said, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Tolkien was very much like Northern European only. We can have giants, we can have ants, those are northern European monsters. We're not going to have centaurs and all that southern European garbage. Um, he was very serious about keeping his lores separated. Uh, whereas this guy is like, eh, Christian, pagan, 
It's all good. It's funny, when you get into the Renaissance period, like the English Renaissance, about 150 years later, you're going to find Christians who are very, very into um, astrology. And like, and what is it when you try to get lead, uh, gold from lead? That's called um, alchemy. Alchemy. Like they were very serious about this and like, and it, like we would look at that and be like, um, bro, that's kind of witchcraft. And they were, and, and I think we're right about that, by the way. That looks like witchcraft, but like to their culture, it was like, eh, this is fine. It's like, mm. you know, uh, you know, and maybe they'd call us out on some things too. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, the blessed inconsistencies of, uh, of humanity. So there you have it. Okay, we get from. The fall of Troy to Rome to England. We are of the same stuff as those Romans were. We're going to be great someday, I tell you. Yeah, we're kind of a backwater now, but boy, I tell you what. So they're building up in some, like, kind of deliberately building up in English literature, which doesn't exist yet. You know, there's some old English, but it's, like, not a tradition in the way that, like, wow, Dante, like, that guy's impressive. Wow, Virgil, like, I, like those, those Italians, wow, they have, a, they have a tradition. I'm going to do that, too, it says. Um, says this guy, says, uh, Chaucer is less nationalistic and more a man of the world. We'll, we'll get to that later. Um, all right, so backstory done, present day. What's the celebration? What's the holiday? Christmas. It's Christmas time. Yay. Okay. So a very happy celebratory vibe. And my favorite part. I found it so random. It's Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And everyone's supposed to be celebrating, and he just yep. does it right there in front of them. Hey guys, it's beheading time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On Christmas. Record scratch. Mm. Um, so, my favorite part uh, before the um, Gawain, sorry, before the Green Knight comes riding in, I love uh, Arthur. How does the poet characterize Arthur specifically? Okay, this is like an interesting version of Arthur. You know he's the king. What else? What can you tell me about him as a character? I don't know. He goes on to say like he's like he's very like boyish. Like he's yes. Like very enthusiastic. Yes. Enthusiastic, boyish. He's kind of sitting over this party. He's easily bored. Okay. He wants like okay. When do we get to joust? Like come on. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's Turkey. not like super dignified. No. Yeah. That's absolutely right. You get to, uh, later on in, in real English history, you know, you, you get to um, uh, Henry VIII, who was a real, a king, right? In, and I mean that in a bad way. <laughs> and a king, like, in the way that you think of, like, Pharaoh in the Bible, or, like, Nebuchadnezzar. Like, my way goes, if I tell you to kill that guy, you kill that guy. Like, a real tyrant king. That's Henry VIII. He is, um, he has, he's very powerful, Okay. Not all kings are as powerful. We think king is a king, right? Like what he says goes. Like, um, not really. That's not actually how history works. Some kings are stronger than others. Over their own people, I mean. Not even in terms of conquering, I mean over their own people. What I mean by that is like consider King John who signs the Magna Carta. And what does the Magna Carta do? It kind of grants basic rights. Like, um, I think like... You know, you have the right to a trial. You can't be uh, Magna Carta. You can't be grandfathered into. If I write a, 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 if the king makes a law today, and you broke that same law last year, you can't be tried under a new law. Uh, there's a legal term for this, and I can't think of it right now. But like basic stuff like that, where you and I would just think like, yeah, obviously. Um, uh, but it wasn't obvious at the time. King John signed the Magna Carta. Why? Because he was a decent well-meaning king? No, because his barons took him by the scruff of the neck and said, sign this, you know, with ink or blood. And he's like, oh, we're good, we're good. Um, so like, yeah, so kings have limitations and always have uh, and always will, more or less. And then you get somebody like Stalin, who like, you know, pure tyrant, what he says goes. Anyway, uh, this is uh, back in the 1380s. You get uh, Richard II, who does a lot to um, 
dignify the court. For example, <laughs> he introduces um, handkerchiefs. <laughs> We're not just going to spit on the floor anymore, guys. We're going to be fancy. Handkerchiefs. Uh, like he eats with utensils now. Um, you know, like, because the arc we're going, if we end with Henry VIII, like the impressive, you know, golden monarch who is a total tyrant, uh, at the end of this arc, you know, like, we start with, like, you guys played Skyrim? Like, like you see, like, the thanes and stuff? Like, they're just, they're just guys. Like, they're, you know, just a guy at the end of the day. It's not, he's not that fancy, okay? We're starting from, like, sort of unfancy kings to, like, uh, it's like what you said last time, how yeah. they just kind of live in the hut next to you. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was a bigger hut. Right. But it was, like, they weren't these untouchables, mm -hmm. right? Um, in the way that, like, you know, don't even turn your back on the king. If he's in the room, like, you can't, like, it's like, come on. So, Arthur is, um, at this point, um, he's good. Like, in the Arthurian legends, he's always, like, virtuous. Um, more or less, but pretty much virtuous. Um, he's the best king uh, England ever had or will have in the legends uh, you might know. He's the once and the future king, okay? So he's going to come back. And this is, like, so Christian, you know, don't even have to explain it, like the return of the king, right? Um, yeah. Uh, and in this particular story, he is restless, he's young, he wants, he's looking for a fight. Um, not cruel, just kind of like very boyish and energetic and doesn't want to sit still through this boring party scene. Uh, that's who he is. And as luck would have it, he doesn't have to do so for long. In comes the green knight. He's all green. What else do you notice about uh, this dude? He's all green, but that's not the end of his interestingness. He's giant, like really large. Mm -hmm. He's like what does it come out to? Something like nine feet tall. Now, in these old stories, we talked about how, like, height and distance, you kind of, was this in my world like cloud? Like, height is kind of played with in the old stories. Like, Thor in one scene is, like, six feet tall, and then all of a sudden he's 100 feet tall. And, like, it doesn't really explain the difference. He's just, okay, uh, that's how we're going to play this. Don't worry about it. Um, so height is very malleable, but he's definitely uh, a giant. Um, he's, you know, he's small enough to fit in the castle, okay, in, in this room. He's not like a super, super huge, um, but he is taller than anyone living, the poet says here. So, you know, I don't know, what is that, eight, nine feet, something like that. Super tall, all green. What else? His appearance is like there's a lot going on. Yep. Hulk of the He's a Hulk. Yeah. He's, um, his clothes are green. What else about his clothes specifically? There's also like gold. Gold. gold going on. Yeah. He's like, there's golden embroidery. He's dressed super fancy. It's like he's wearing a tuxedo or something. Like, okay. Here is the Green Knight, uh, updated to today. Um, they're having a party in the Oval Office. I don't know. And um, they're drinking their eggnog, whatever. They're having a good time. And a young guy like Biden is uh, uh, just looking for some fun. And in on his motorcycle crashes through the wall this hulk of a dude wearing a camo tuxedo, you know, with golden, I don't know, cuffs and like a chain or something. So, like, no, no two parts, here's the Green Knight, no two parts of his description make sense together. Like, like, are you, you're just fancy, but you're green? Like, are you an outdoorsman? Like, what the, I don't understand you, okay? It was also giving Oz. Giving Oz? Yeah, like, giving, you know? <laughs> okay. So, I mean, like, I was reminded of the Wizard of Oz. Mm. Let me say it that way. <laughs> oh, yeah, emerald green. And I was like, this is... Yeah. This is awesome. I know the, the line I pulled out from the text was, yeah. I find fettle. <laughs> yeah, that too. Yeah, he's a, he's a fine fettle. That's, fine that's for darn sure. Fettle. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, is he an outdoorsman? He seems like it. You know, outdoorsmen wear green. They didn't have camo back here, but so you would, you know, like you've seen like, you know, the, the Disney version of Robin Hood where the fox is in all green. Like that's from, that's historical. Like you would, if you're going to go hunting, wear green maybe, you know, so you, you're, 
that's what they had for camo. Um, he's got what's in his hands? He's wielding two things. Axe. An axe. Okay, and it's it's a battle axe specifically, not a chopping axe, a battle axe. So the illustrator got, gets this right. Where is it? Okay. It's a battle axe. This is a, like a halberd situation kind of a thing uh, that the Vikings would have used. Uh, battle axe. What's in his other hand? Cleaver. Not a cleaver. Of holly. It's a sprig of holly. Because it's okay. Christmas. It's Christmas time. <laughs> okay, and holly, the reason why holly to this day is a Christmas um, ornament is that um, it, uh, it's green in wintertime. Holly is evergreen. You get these green leaves in the forest here and there. Holly is, is, a, is a, what's the word I'm looking for, a parasite? So it'll attach itself to trees and be green. Um, in wintertime, it's like, oh, it never dies. It's, it's life and death, okay? And so that is the green knight. For whatever else he is, and he's confusing as a sign, if we want to get all structuralist about it. He, like, what is he meant to signify? I don't know. It's, it's tough. But one thing we can say for sure, there's an association with nature, with rebirth, <clears throat> that's going to happen as soon as he gets his head chopped off. And so the deal is the game, the beheading game, and this is not the only time in literature where you get a beheading game, though this is maybe the most famous time you get a beheading game, is, all right, guys, here's the deal. One of you chops my head off, and then a year and a day, not just a year, a year and a day, um, I get my turn to chop your head off. And everyone's like, uh, what is going on? No, everyone's quiet. No one says anything until who speaks up first? Can't not go away. It's Arthur. it's Arthur of all people. Arthur's like, fine, I'll do it myself. And then Gawain's like, oh, sit down. Okay, Arthur, uh, it, this kind of like shame, like you're the king, you shouldn't have to do this. It kind of shames Gawain into, all right, fine, I will defend the court's honor. And I guess if I get to cut your head off first, like what's the catch? Like. Uh, and then soon enough he learns that like yes he cuts off the head and the catch is the green knight picks it up and says see you in a year today loser ha 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 <coughs> okay so this is the deal this is the game and um, for uh, I didn't read the your version but there's a word in the old version uh, that is depending on how you spell it something like this Trial. It looks kind of like truth. Um, we get this in modern English. Maybe, have you heard this? By my troth. Um, we get this expression, by my troth. You, no one's used this in 200 years, but it is. If you read books, it shows up. By my troth. It means something like it, something like truth, honor, nobility, or something like this. Okay. And so Gawain is defending not only his troth, but the, the uh, round table's troth. Yes. I remember if it was in the chapter 10 or footnotes, but I wrote it down because she was talking about this. So it mentions truth, but then it spells troth, T-R-O-T-H, and it says that yeah, it sure. means okay. faith pledged by one's word and owed to the Lord. Yeah. So that's yes. Galway and Arthur relationship. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's it's uh, reputation. Mm -hmm. It's all, it captures all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. Um, I want to fast forward to my last point because I only have three minutes left. Okay, so you get the uh, I love the so the first book we just covered the first book ends like here ish. The second book uh, is my personal favorite. It's his. It's just the journey from point A to point B, and he fights the uh, boars. He fights boars and he fights bears and he fights dragons and wodwos. No one knows what a wodwo is. Uh, it's an unknown thing. Um, troll maybe. Um, that's book two. Book three is the uh, the game with uh, Bertilak, which is I give you what I catch, you give me what you catch, um, and it's here that uh, the Gawain fibs. Okay, he gets the green girdle, and he says I didn't get anything, and he wants the green girdle because it's magic. He's told it's going to keep his head on. It's not actually magic. Uh, but he is lied to, and he keeps it. He should, given the rules of the game, he should give it away, but he keeps it, and so he fibs. And when the Green Knight, in the end, doesn't cut his head off, but like they have a conversation, he nicks, you know, he kind of like um, checks, check swings twice. Uh, then he just cuts, uh, gives him a cut on the neck, and then he's like, 
Uh, lol, just kidding. It, well, I was never going to cut your head off. Uh, I'm Bertilak. It was me the whole time. Uh, the what's your face? Morgana put a spell on me to, and I was just trying to. She just wanted to scare um, Guinevere to die. <laughs> it was all a game. <laughs> okay. And Gawain's attitude, like you might think, it's relief. It's not relief. What is Gawain's attitude of you? Yeah, and it's it's not just that. Like he wants to, he really wants to beat himself up over this. Yeah. Really, like all of his friends are laughing about it. That's key in the very end. Everyone laughs but him, and it's like, and his attitude seems to be, you, you don't understand. Uh, and I always suggest in my world lit class, like maybe you do understand. Like, maybe is it Gawain that gets it, or is it his friends that get it? And what do they get? Like, going, you were never the perfectly prof knight that you thought you were. Welcome to being a human like the rest of us, butthead. <laughs> like, you thought you were something. And look, you fib. Like, yeah, okay, we give you an A minus. And, uh, and uh, Gawain can't handle that. He needs to be the knight of perfection. His, the star on his shield is an indicator. It's a, it's a symbol of perfection in the medieval period. Um, and he can't be good, he, needs, he can't be great, he needs to be perfect, and when he's not perfect, he can't deal with it. This is a poem about perfectionism. And it's a Christian poem about perfectionism. You, no one is perfect except for one guy, okay? And it's not you. Um, so one of the reasons I like this poem so much is I really identify, some, you might not, I don't know what you think of me, but I know for sure I have been perfectionistic in many ways in my life, and this poem is a gentle slap in the mouth that says, Get over yourself. You're normal just like the rest of us. Hey, you're the best of us, but you're still one of us. Um, get over it. What you thought was virtue was arrogance. What you thought was virtue was arrogance. Um, get over it. I'm reading a lot into that last um, paragraph, but I, I do think that it's there. We're out of time. Um, Maury, I, I looked at the assignment sheet and I forgot. What are we doing for next time? Anybody have it? It's the two PDFs. That's yes, okay, and those are, those are up online. Uh, I think I gave you the original um, Celtic, just to, obviously just to look at. Don't even try to read it. But then the, there's an English version of it. Um, and we'll see that. Yeah, I mean, it, you think that stuff looks like new language, like Celtic is just something different.